This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Cyber Frontiers, show number six, recorded on August 18th, 2014. Here on Cyber Frontiers, we explore cybersecurity, big data, and the technology shaping the future through an academic perspective. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the AverageGuy.tv studios here in Bellevue, Nebraska. And we post the show with world-class show notes and some very good show notes tonight, by the way, out at TheAverageGuy.tv. If you have questions, comments, or contributions, you can contact us. Send us an email. Just send that directly to me, Jim at TheAverageGuy.tv. You can track me down on Twitter at Jay Collison. Or now, call in those questions. And for this program, this would be Dynamite. If you have cybersecurity, big data questions you want to throw in here, give us a call, 402 402- Four seven eight eight four five zero. Leave a voicemail. We'll play them right on the show, and Christian will answer. Christian and maybe Ashton as well will answer them live. Joining me tonight from the comforts of his summer cottage in uh, Buffalo, New York. I like that, Christian. The I do summer cottage. The summer cottage. That's what it's turned into, right? Uh, haven't haven't had this as my backdrop for podcasting in at least six months. Um, I know, if not we, more. So it's it's well it's great being back here. It's arguably much cooler than it is in DC. Um, probably the coldest summer for Buffalo, which is actually even surprising. I don't yeah. think people really think oh cold in the winter. Yeah, that's Buffalo, but in the summer kind of weird. But hey, it's not bad, and uh, it's been a great time being back and uh, looking forward to tonight. Very cool. It's good to see you there as well. And if you've watched uh, Home Gadget Geeks or Home Tech for any length of time, you know that's uh, Christian's domicile there in Buffalo. We also want to welcome a new guest to the program, a fellow student with Christian at the University of Maryland College Park, Ashton Webster. Ashton, great to have you on the program. It's great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm really excited to be uh, here with Christian again, and it should be fun. Good, good to have you. Hey, since we haven't really met you officially on the podcast, uh, give us a little rundown on you, where you're from, what you do, those kinds of things. Sure. So I am I was born in California. Uh, I was born in Los Angeles and moved to New Jersey when I was nine. And then nine years later, I went to the University of Maryland. Um, but I'm right in New Jersey right now. Uh, this is my home, too. You can see some of the interesting things I have going on back Your there. Your summer... Well. Your summer uh, cottage, my, so my summer, summer home. So that uh, it's good to be back. But I'm also a member of the ACES program with Christian. That's the Advanced Cybersecurity Experience for Students, and that's a been a really great experience. I mean, it's allowed me to meet him, so that's that's a good start. Um, and in addition, I do research with that that program on machine learning. Um, and currently, I'm working with a company called Stinger Nefarian Technologies, putting together a basically a data processing for a, a way to process packet captures and and find patterns in them. So, hopefully, I can uh, contribute. I know Christian's been uh, a great influence on me, so hopefully, I can uh, live up to the his excellent podcasting skills as well. Oh, all right. Very good. Well, we're excited to have you on and, and uh, excited that you could be part of it. We like to get right down to business. Christian, I'm going to throw it over to you. We haven't, um, you know, we have had a, a kind of a weird summer schedule. We're hoping to kind of get back on track. We're starting on Monday nights now for a while. We'll just see how it goes and uh, try and get a few of these kicked out. Uh, but what are you going to cover tonight? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the, uh, well, it's it's one of these old topics, but I think it's coming to it's coming full circle to be a new topic again, and that's uh, HTTPS SSL. And it's kind of I, I I hope you don't hear those words and I'm like okay I'm done with the show. No, um, <laughs> the the whole talk on SSL has really gotten heated back up with um, you know Snowden and then Heartbleed and all these things. And yet it's still the um, encryption standard for the web that we kind of rely on the most um, at this point. So I just want to talk about, have, have a conversation quickly about, you know, what is SSL and HTTPS in case there's some background information that you want to have filled in. And then I want to talk about some of the new news items around SSL that happened um, just last week and uh, talk about what I've been doing with that and uh, go from there. So um, Ashton's going to cover a little bit about uh, just the how how we get to SSL and and what it, what's actually going on. Yeah, so the five minute intro to SSL is essentially the 
the little anecdote I must give you is you want to send a message to your friend or you, you have a, um, a request for him. Let's say you want a picture of a cat. Um, and that's essentially what the HTTP request is. You're asking a web server or something for some sort of information. Um, but you realize that this isn't the most secure way of doing things because there can be people in between you and that's called a man in the middle attack. So there, there's, it's not secure and it's not authentic. Um, so to combat that, you can come up with an algorithm that creates a mes message authentication code. Um, and that takes your message, your request for, for information and uh, basically makes it so that if it's modified in any way, the recipient would know. Your, your friend that's giving you these cat pictures would find out and, um, and then it could just be disregarded because you know someone's intercepted it. Um, so that's essentially what the secure socket layer does, the SSL. Um, and that allows for not only authentication, but also encryption of the message so that it can't be read by anyone else. Um, and at certain points it even allowed for compression, which was sort of an efficiency measure, but that's being, I, I believe that's being deprecated in the later versions of it, but that's pretty much the, the basic level of it. HTTPS is just the combination of this um, request that you're making in HTTP and the secure socket layer in SSL. So yeah, and it's interesting too because that's you know a standard that we've trusted for our you know our merchant cards, anything that's a login, etc. Um, and I think it's really come under scrutiny with um, the revelation of you know Open SSL and Heartbleed being an issue. And you know, hey, how are we actually implementing this algorithm? What are we doing with it? And you know, are there are there more zero days out there that we don't know about? Um, and so the interesting news bit that I'm spinning on this tonight is that Google announced last week that their PageRank algorithm was now going to take into consideration um, SSL or having your website HTTPS enabled as a slight edge over non-encrypted sites in its search engine. And that's pretty huge because um, this conversation started back in 2012 and several people, you know, really asked Google, hey, if I, you know, reset up my site to be HTTPS only, is there any advantage? And Google basically said, no, we're going to treat it, you know, just the same way um, and basically just make sure you do your 301 redirects and your forwarding all the same. That'll be fine. Um, well, their opinion on that has greatly shifted, and that's due in part to the fact that Google has been making a big initiative to try and keep everything in transit encrypted. So now Gmail is point-to-point -point encrypted. Um, all Well, obviously all Gmail services or Google services are also um, encrypted. And so now they're using this as a slight leverage to uh, convince the internet to upgrade. Um, and in a post-Snowden era, um, the SSL era web web um, portion of all websites on the internet has gone from one percent to three percent, which is you know again small percentages, but you know we now have three times more the number of websites than what we previously did um, that are SSL enabled, and I'm pretty sure that with Google um, stepping in and you know holding a little carrot stick for webmasters like myself to go after and do those SSL upgrades um, we're gonna see probably somewhere close to five percent in the next year or so um, and and a lot of people look at SSL and they basically say "Ooh, you know this is expensive I'm just running a blog why do I need to do this um, and so I wanted to quickly kind of go through some ways in which you can get SSL working for you really effectively, really efficiently, and on the cheap, which is what I did when I saw that, okay, Google is going to give me this carrot stick. I want to eat the carrot. So that's what I decided to do. Um, and you'll notice a couple of my sites now are now um, HTTPS enabled, and hopefully uh, the average guy will be among those ranks sooner rather than later. Um, but we have biosmods.com is now HTTPS only. And we also have a new site, cyberfrontierlabs.com is HTTPS only. And uh, we'll talk about that website a little bit later in the show, but that's the official laboratory of this podcast. So we are now putting up articles on big data and cybersecurity, and we're showing you some cool development exercises and ways that you can start learning about these technologies in a kind of you know development casual way and, and get some value out of it. So we'll, we'll spin back to that a little bit later. Um, Ashton, uh, you found this week some interesting statistics on um, SSL usage and what certificate providers are using SSL and that is 
arguably uh, almost an equally important part of what is HTTPS because on one side we have the encryption and the messaging but on the other side we have okay we need a signed certificate and we need to validate that the person who's sending us or the system that's sending us this traffic um, is a, a valid authentic source and there's different levels of SSL encryption that we can use that will allow us to have, you know, the nice little green HTTPS in our web bar and to be doing um, secure transactions on the internet. So, you know, the big names out there have been Rapid SSL, Komodo, GeoTrust, um, VeriSign, Symantec. You know, those are the big names that you always hear. Uh, GoDaddy. And with the big names, you also hear big price tags. I mean, there are some SSL certificates you can buy that would cost you almost three thousand a year. Um, just to be able to say, yes, I have this SSL certificate signed by GoDaddy or by Symantec. Um, and so in order to understand why that's so expensive and how we get it to be super cheap, um, there's, there's two things at play. One, there are different levels of certificate authenticity. And at the very um, top level, so the cream of the crop SSL certificate is called an extended validation certificate. And that's where you actually, when you go to purchase an SSL certificate, there's someone sitting behind a desk who's manually verifying the person, the organization, the, you know, the services, the domain, it's a very thorough process. And that costs, you know, that runs anywhere from like two to two to 3,000 a year in expenses to have an extended validation certificate. Um, probably the easiest example I can give you of what extended validation looks like is if you go to twitter.com you'll notice when you go to twitter.com it's automatically https and you'll see that little green bar it says twitter comma inc and us that means it's extended validation because there's a green bar in the address bar and it has the name of the organization that is sending you um encrypted based web traffic so that's at the, the very high end in the mid-tier range you have what's called organization validation and this is kind of similar to extended validation but it's not as thorough and it's probably going to cost you in probably the i would say hundreds to maybe 1500 a year range um, you can get those numbers down a little bit but again it always depends on you know what provider is signing your certificates you can find that you know for a particular type of certificate level Komodo will charge X dollars a month more than Semantic, for example. Um, and at the end of the day, it all really comes down to um, browser recognition. So you want to make sure that the certificates you're buying are going to be considered valid by um, the customers and the users who are using your websites. And so, you know, when you get something signed um, by a big name like uh, Symantec, obviously that, you know, all the browsers are going to say, yeah, this is good to go, um, move on. Uh, so that's that's also important to take into consideration when buying certificates and the last level which I, I'm gonna call the basic starter package but really gives you everything you need to be successful in HTTPS and that's called domain name based validation of your certificate and that's really the most effective route for 99% of SSL um, if you go to google.com that's not even an extended validation certificate that's just a regular domain based certificate just like what I'm talking to you about um, and what, what that does is all it's doing is really saying, all it's being validated is that, hey, this web server is in fact the owner of this domain name in which you're connecting to. So it's not, so you can include your organization information and location, but that's not being validated. The only thing that's being validated is the actual domain name and ownership of that domain name. And we call that about a 40% confidence rating. So, but again, these are the types of certificates that run the a big majority of what we have in the HTTPS internet. Um, and that's really uh, critical. But even then, when you look at those, I've seen domain-based um, certificates like that go for like 80 bucks a month. And so for most webmasters, it's like, why should I bother swinging that money? I might as well just pay $10 for a domain and not worry about it. Uh, but the second component to this is resellers, which uh, I think people get a little bit nervous by the word resellers, but let me kind of explain why this is good for SSL. Um, so the process of reselling is basically another company opens up shop and says, hey, we're going to sell SSL certificates to you. And you're like, oh, great. Um, so why is this cheaper? Well, basically what they're doing is they're paying big money to um, you know, like a, a semantic or a Komodo to say, hey, sign this master top level 
um, root certificate of ours. So then we can use our certificate to sign our customer's certificate. So you establish what's called a, a hierarchy of trust where you have the very top level SSL signers, certificate authorities, and those certificate authorities sign other certificate authorities. So you get these resellers that are willing to pay the money to get that, and then they set the prices. So some are going for volume, some are going for quality, etc. Um, the service that I've been using now is called SSLS.com. SSL is basically what they're trying to get at with that acronym. Um, but that goes through Namecheap, which you've probably heard is a great way to get uh, domains on the cheap. Um, and that is now also the case for SSLs at SSLS.com. Um, I bought two certificates from them. And for five years, I'm paying $25 for five years. That's five bucks a year to have SSL domain valid certificates that otherwise cost like 80 bucks a month. So it's a super affordable adoption for most webmasters and it's gonna give you that slight edge that you get over um, your quote competitors on Google to have encrypted traffic and to you know have the have the green show up and not the this is an untrusted site if you do a self signed certificate so that's a huge deal um, you know for twenty five dollars for for five bucks a year I was like yeah sign me up where do I sign um, and that's really great so when I went ahead and did that um, I basically paid with PayPal they take Bitcoin they take whatever you want. Um, and then you get an email that says, hey, um, so I bought what's called the Positive SSL, and that's a, a separate brand of SSL certificates that is uh, owned by Komodo. And that's about 5% of the SSL uh, market now, which is actually pretty impressive. Uh, so I you know, buy the certificate, and just within 15 minutes, it's in my email, uh, and coming directly from Komodo.com, going through the activation process and then, you know, bam, um, I have a certificate um, signing happening. And hey, that's, Christian. yeah. Could I just jump in and ask a question real quick? Um, yeah, absolutely. Do you have any like qualms about, <clears throat> you're talking about resellers and how you got this certificate for five years for 25 bucks, right? Sure. And is there any security concern that you have at having this, you know, one level of abstraction between you and the actual seller? Is there any, um, you know, decreased or is there any detriment to the security when, when you buy from the reseller instead of the direct source? Yeah, so that's a great point. And, uh, and the reason why it's such a great point is that uh, I think a year or two ago, um, someone in Iran had hijacked one of the master uh, root certificate signings and they were basically just signing whatever they wanted and it was showing up as valid. And that's a huge problem. And to be honest, the standard of how we do certificate authorities and sign certificates has always been a little bit like, man, why did we ever do it this way? But um, generally, um, stick to the common resellers. I would say the SSLS um, service, which is run by Namecheap, I mean, very reputable organization, and they've been doing business with Komodo for a long time. So they've been able to keep the uh, security of those certificates um, for since they've been in business. So that's like a good sign that you know you can do business with them. Um, I, the things I look out for is like making sure that the pay the payment system looks right. There's nothing funny there. I even when I was looking at because the prices were so great and I was like, oh, I really want to make sure I'm not getting myself into some shady stuff here. You know, I sure. yeah, I looked and validated that they were in fact associated with Namecheap. You know, here was the business titles and here's how they were doing transactions. And you know, I knew that my research was right when I got an email directly from Komodo.com with my certificate, and it wasn't. You know, I validated that too, and it was all good. So it's kind um, of a, a funny irony that you have to check that the people are giving you the certificate to say who you are validate the people the that are distributing those or who they say are yeah it's a, it's a complicated process but it's good to know that our website is protected by https yeah HTTPS so now. and and really at the end of the day i don't care i just care about having it green because i don't want people going oh this is like a this is a site trying to send me scary things like back out once you're once you're quote in the green um you have no problems and it gives you good adoption um, so Google actually has done a great job too of outlining what the process is to basically go from an HTTP only site to HTTPS only because I ran BIOS mods for about a month in both like you could hit 
either unsecure or secured and it would resolve to either one. Um, and I did that because I was like, oh, I have no idea what this, what kind of impact this is going to have on my uh, search engine optimization. And I want to make sure that Google picks up all my new URLs correctly. So I just did this transition with Google Webmasters and I'll include the instructions that Google provides in the uh, show notes. Uh, but that went really, really well. And I just noticed today that over like 70 to 80 percent of my content had already been re-indexed in Google. And so if you're Googling Biosmods related links in Google now, you're already seeing the HTTPS only version. It's not doing the redirects anymore. So that was really helpful. Um, the other big thing for webmasters that is helpful for adopting this technology is a, a technology actually, well, it's it's primarily I'm using it in an Apache um, web server environment, but this is something that can be supported by IIS and a lot of other web servers, and that's called um, SNI-based name resolution. And so what, is, what does that mean? Um, what it boils down to is a lot of people use uh, Apache virtual hosts or the you know host headers and equivalent to host multiple domains and websites on one master server, one IP address. That's how shared web hosting environments work. Um, and so one thing that's really important is how can I get multiple sites in my virtual host settings to support HTTPS. And if you think about it, this is a problem because the whole point of SSL is that all of your traffic is encrypted, right? And the whole way in which virtual host technology works is when a request is coming into the web server, it reads what that host header is and it determines like, oh, this this host header says, you know, the average guy.tv, then drop it to this website container, right? That's how that's how virtual hosts work. But when you're using HTTPS and everything's encrypted, you can't read that host header because it's encrypted. So um, this SNI-based technology uses a similar um, approach where it looks at the, um, it basically looks at the certificate request coming in and what how that hierarchy works and, and tries to match the domain there. Um, and so this works for everything except for Windows XP Internet Explorer. So if you're using Internet Explorer on Windows XP only, this when you try and go to a site that's using this technology, it'll it'll most likely dump you to the first site in the index. So you may not make it to your actual site. I'm perfectly okay with this, and that's because I think most webmasters are trying to force people to get off XP and actually upgrade their stuff, right? So, um, and this is kind of like when everyone said, "Hey, we're done supporting IE6. You know, upgrade or fend for yourself." I think this is kind of the equivalent in the uh, SSL world. So really, you're going to cover like 95% of your users. I've checked on my Google Analytics to say, hi, hey, how many people are coming in from Windows XP plus Internet Explorer? And it's a very low. It's like 2 or 3% at most. Um, and so that and that's over a pretty big sample of uh, traffic that I have access to. So um, that's a really great way to, to go ahead and do that. Uh, the other big thing, too, is that, um, and, and Ashton uh, and I have been talking about this a lot, and it was brought up um, last week as well on uh, Home Gadget Geeks, was, uh, you know, what do you think about all these different types of SSL implementations? So we have OpenSSL, which had Heartbleed and freaked everyone out. We have, um, you know, all these different standards. So which one's the most secure? How do you want to do that, etc.? Uh, I think most people are still really um, comfortable with OpenSSL because that's the default that's included with Apache and with a lot of Linux distributions. And so people are much more content to just say, okay, I'm going to patch my system, no big deal, versus, oh, like I'm going to go find another way to implement um, the SSL um, implementation, right? So um, there are a couple different options out there, though. I think one of the um, most interesting ones that has come out is called Libre SSL. And uh, Ashton, do you want to talk a little bit about what that is? Yeah, so essentially when OpenSSL was catching all the flack for the Heartbleed bug, the Git repository was forked, um, which essentially just copied and, and they started the, this group, um, I believe it's OpenBSD, started making fixes to the primary problems that existed in OpenSSL. In addition to Heartbleed, um, they had a, a really large backlog of, of bugs that they hadn't gotten around to fixing. It was in the hundreds, um, and, and a lot of the really old ones were just kind of disregarded. Um, but that was by OpenSSL. When Lib LibreSSL picked it up, they started fixing all these and just all around made it a, a significant amount of progress 
making it more secure. So that's another uh, increasingly popular option that sort of forked off of OpenSSL very recently and has kind of made leaps and bounds towards becoming a, a uh, serious contender in, in the options for um, the implementation of SSL. And I think that's important to make that distinction that we've kind of shifted from talking about where certificates are coming from and what the actual implementations of, of SSL are, because I actually was a little bit confused about this going in. Like, the there's a separation between how it's actually implemented and where the certificates are coming from. So um, it's it, those are two potential areas for improvement in security. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I think um, we actually didn't really look at the... I mean, LibreSSL is pretty new, right? So not many people are using that at this point yet. But uh, it just goes to show you that um, there's a lot of open source efforts to keep the encryption standards kind of open and all the source code available so that, you know, there's, I guess, added trust in these standards um, and that they're not being subverted, which has been a big problem um, with other um, encryption programs like uh, uh, TrueCrypt, which just does like hard drive based file encryption. Um, so this is in that same bucket of like, we really need to be able to trust the SSL version of uh, of HTTPS web. And, and the thing is, the open source doesn't necessarily guarantee that the code is perfect, um, but at least there's that layer of transparency where you can go through and check it. I mean, um, a good example of that is the Heartbleed bug was, I mean, it was public for a while. There, It was over there, two years. People over just two had, years yeah, and people just day. didn't realize it. And I don't think that there was in, any intent to, to sneak in this this bug in the first place. Um, and I mean, it was open for everyone to see, but it still took a long time to find it. So yeah. the, it doesn't make perfect code. It doesn't take away all the security flaws, but it does at least allow you to get a group of people together and look at it critically and say, these are where the areas that need to be fixed. And these are the areas where potential flaws can be. Sure. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, it's important that I, I think Thing, really basic things like versioning control and you know having the real open source philosophy and we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the show with Apache um, so I'm glad that we're connecting these dots but yeah. those are like the hallmark things that we as a technology community can do to ensure that we are maintaining the authenticity and trust uh, in these algorithms. And I think that's really important. Um, one last thing before we uh, switch gears out of cybersecurity and into uh, the world of big data, um, I wanted to mention that one of the really pesky things about transitioning from a HTTP only based site to a HTTPS based site is that a lot of times you have URLs that are hard coded or embedded in your website that are still using the HTTP protocol. And so when you try and go to an HTTPS page and you have a, a non-secure resource embedded in that in that layout, it will the padlock will go from green to yellow. And it's basically a warning saying, hey, not all the communication we received from this site was encrypted. Some of it was coming over insecure. And so there's this website called whynopadlock.com. And that basically, if you put in your site that you're having that problem with, it will show you all the resources that are being requested in HTTP only, and that will very quickly help you go and update your templates to do uh, to make sure you're referencing the HTTPS version of the site. There's also this uh, neat technique you can do that's called um, uh, protocol lists based URLs. And it's basically, instead of doing, in, instead of writing a, a, a link in your site as HTTP colon slash slash or HTTPS colon slash slash, you can just leave that out and just make it slash slash at the beginning. And then when the browser is reading your code, it automatically will pick which protocol to use based off which endpoint you hit. And that's if you're doing, you know, if you support both unsecure or secure. Again, I'm now recommending folks do HTTPS only because Google has clearly signaled this will improve your page rank and will um, they'll support the transition with webmaster tools and making sure you're not losing content in the Google search and page rank results. Um, so just that's a good resource to have in mind. And we'll drop all the resources on um, the changes in SSL usage over time, how you can get set up on the cheap, um, and how you can implement these certificates in the show notes. Uh, Christian, let me, let me ask you real quick, though. So uh, AverageGuy.tv got lots of links referenced back to itself for all the media files. 
Right. And we put those in. I hard code those in. You know, I go to a link and put HTTP, blah, 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 for right. the .mp3. How's it going to handle those when if I, if we if we upgrade and and you're telling me for twenty five bucks for five years that's all that's really all you're waiting for? Yep. Serious? Okay. Serious. So, <laughs> so, uh, but how's it going to handle those links? Right. So one of the great things with Apache or most web servers in general is that you can do URL rewriting. Uh, and so basically I have a definition in my web hosting configurations that says if any HTTP resource is requested, automatically rewrite the URL to have an S into it. And so the user is just transparently redirected and it gets the secure version automatically. And they, they don't even notice it until they see, oh, I'm on HTTPS, but there's no like redirecting page or anything like that. It just writes, rewrites the URL and sends back the encrypted version. Now, if I'm referencing sites that are not unsecure, that would be in the show notes. Lots of those that that sure. go on. Or right. what's what's the what's the status there? Is it gonna? Because I can't update those. Some of right. those sites may not have secure. Sites. No, and absolutely. And so that's not going to affect this. Um, you know, you putting in a link in your show notes that is just a regular HTTP link. That's not what causes the unsecure connection. The only time it causes the unsecure connection is when your browser is trying to actually download a resource from your server that is quote supposed to be encrypted so like the very common example is like if you have a site logo and you hard coded http in and it's trying to download that resource to render the average guy it's going to say hey i got this resource as http only so um, the easiest way to go and fix that in your posts and etc is to either do the protocol list version or just explicitly change your site so like with wordpress you have in your general settings it says you know what is your url when you change that to https it's automatically going to rewrite all that stuff for you so um, there's a couple of content pages where if you've embedded images that are actually loading when you display that page, you'd have to go in and update those. Um, but again, that would just be for like that particular post that you're visiting. So it's very quick to, like I said, hunt down those things and correct it. So. Well, and if I'm keeping most of my photos or most of my, you know, whatever I'm displaying, if those are in the media folder in in the WordPress instance, it, that's all going to automatically update, right? I'm not going to have to go back and fix all those. Yeah, I've had, uh, that should be the quote theory. Um, I had one site that didn't do that. Um, and so the easiest way to do that would just be to write a quick database script that basically goes through that, um, all, all the posts and replaces that for the media files. But um, generally um, doing the replacement in WordPress and setting up that rewrite is going to help you. And then you'll have probably about 5% of your content will not, will need those manual updates. So, so maybe not an average guy, if, if you get into those kinds of issues, maybe not an average guy solution. It can be done. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be done. I would say this is like in between average guy and like, you know, the tech uh, pretty well. I mean, obviously, um, if you're if you're running your server environment, uh, you should be able to do this without too big of a deal. Um, if this is like a shared hosting environment or you're just running like a blog on WordPress.com, it you know your mileage may vary as i like to say um but it's i it's really i i would say on like the one to ten difficulty scale of getting this all set up and done right maybe about a six okay that's good that's why i'm gonna have you do it 25 bucks huh <laughs> yeah i'll send, for I'll send you a check <laughs> yeah and uh it's amazing too how they try and rope you into locking in the five years because i looked at today trying to buy like a three-year versus a five-year it was only one dollar cheaper to buy the three year versus the five year. Well, so. it makes sense to go with five, right? Absolutely, I mean, yeah. If At you're going to do it, you're going to do it. And yep. Our our sites have been around for five years or more, so it, it's uh, it's probably a good buy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so with that, I want to shift it over into big data, and I'm super excited about this because it's been a while since I've given the big data stage on the show. We've been talking some pretty hardcore cybersecurity the last few shows, and uh, Ashton, why don't you take it away? Yeah, you can see he's ready because he's got the, the big data shirt on. Data I've is got the, the new bacon. I like bacon. I, I love it. <laughs> I've got the uh, Tenable shirt on. So, um, yeah, the topic that I wanted to talk about was um, sort of going along with, we talked about some open source options for SSL encryption. Um, and we mentioned that in a lot of cases, the community being able to contribute and um, really have a say in what goes on with the code is is one of the most important parts. So um, we've already mentioned them a bunch of times, but Apache Software Foundation is really, really good at this. 
Um, and I, I wanted to talk about some of the, the, the things that they're doing right now with data processing um, are pretty incredible. So um, essentially, Apache, so Apache Software Foundation, the way it works is it's a meritocracy, which just means that um, it's very democratic in nature. It's, it has to do a lot of times with votes um, to get to the next level. So you start out with a proposal, you get into the incubator um, where you get more support, and then finally you hope to graduate as a top-level project or as a sub-project of the top-level projects. Um, and at that point, you have gained a lot of experience with the mentors, you've um, received probably assistance from the foundation in, in terms of publicity and uh, sometimes in terms of, of funding and just it, it makes the whole process considerably easier. So um, the, the thing that I noticed was that when you look at Apache, there's just this whole zoo of different options that you have um, in terms of, of data processing. So starting at the bottom, um, where the data is actually stored, the de facto distributed file system right now is HDFS, and that's the Hadoop distributed file system. Um, and it used to be that, you know, you would put your data on this thing, and it was closely coupled with Hadoop. It was, you, you know, you had your MatReduce, you had your HDFS, and that was how things were done. Um, it was pretty much one-to-one -one in that case. I mean, like, I, I think Christian and I have written applications for that, and it worked pretty well. Um, but the, the movement now is more towards, you have your HDFS still, um, but now you have multiple applications that can process it. It's not just MapReduce, there's a whole, it's not just Hadoop, it, there's Spark, there's Storm, there's Tez, there's Falcon, there's all sorts of different options that you have to access this data and process it in a meaningful way. Um, so I wanted to start off kind of with like the, the old way of doing things. And it, like Christian can definitely comment on this with uh, like how, how did, what was the process for, for coming up with a Hadoop application? Like what, what did you have to go through? Yeah, and I mean, when I started getting involved with it, it was like right around the time like big data just took a super huge leap in becoming like the buzzword, the thing that everyone had to have yesterday, etc. So when I was doing these development activities pretty hardcore, it was right around the start of, you know, that era where it was just what we defined Hadoop as was HDFS plus MapReduce. And there was like no other mixing or changing of that equation. That's what you did. You wrote batch map reduce jobs that were um some were simple like word count where you just you know you're basically out of these billions of billions of words that you give your hadoop cluster count how many of each occurrence happens that's like the common test to benchmark uh, a traditional hadoop uh, cluster um, but then you would have more complicated ones where the only way you could get it to really do what you wanted it to do was based on the output of one MapReduce job became the input of another MapReduce job. So you ended up having these chained MapReduce jobs. And the ones I used to write to do eh, relatively simple stuff, I would say. I mean, I'd be writing five MapReduce jobs for one output at the end that would be getting used by my analytics or application or whatever. So it kind of sounds like a lot at first. Um, you know, you with MapReduce, it's basically you know key value pairs, and I'm not. I really don't want to lecture on MapReduce because I think people might hurt me. But um, you know, a bunch of key value pairs, and you're coming, and and you're basically once you've created this index, you're constantly you know splitting these up, sending the algorithm out to your cluster, getting each chunk back, merging it, and it's it's very, it's really when it comes down to is a very well well orchestrated merge sort. Um, that's the closest like sorting algorithm comparison I can give you for it without like actually telling you what all the architectural differences are. And I always like to think of HDFS as like computer level RAID where you're raiding together computers instead of hard drives and your hard drives are, are just a bunch of disks. Um, so those are the quick iterations. But I mean, we used to do these applications and, you know, very, um, you know, it was big because everyone's like, you know, we're storing big data in this data lake in this big warehouse without SQL. There's no databases. We're just chucking data at it and we can write these, you know, little map roost jobs and get some stuff out of it. And so everyone thought that was cool. But then everyone was like, uh, well, this is actually kind of constraining after a while because eventually all you're doing is just writing batch jobs. It's just repeated 
um, you know, same architecture, same style. And there's a lot of other things you can do with this type of architecture that is not necessarily conducive to a MapReduce application. So then um, when Hadoop 2.0 came out, this was like the first time everyone was like, whoa, like we can do other things besides MapReduce. And that was uh, Yarn, which is called Yet Another Resource Manager. Um, and that really was the first time that we could create distributed applications using whatever model we wanted. And that was a big evolution for Hadoop, especially as Hadoop started becoming more visible in the enterprise, as they started looking to integrate you know, the security features and the other aspects of you know, a big data platform that would you know, not just be a cute open source application for developers to get excited about, but actually be something that was sustainable and workable in the enterprise. And then very quickly you saw things that came out of the Google um, white paper on uh, Bigtable. So you started seeing HBase and Hive and Zookeeper. And before you knew it, the word Hadoop went from meaning HDFS plus MapReduce to like HDFS and 10 other things. And it was like you could pick and choose and, you know, 10 factorial combinations, how many different ways you wanted to set up a, a big data platform. And now we've gotten to the point where, um, we have so many different implementations and, and you're going to talk about some of those, so I won't steal a thunder there, but, um, it's just amazing to see how many different groups, both as like paid enterprise solutions and as open source Apache projects have really transformed the big data, um, mindset and what Apache offers in this space, um, beyond what Doug Cutting's original kind of implementation of Hadoop was back in 2008. Yeah, I mean, it's become a lot more complicated to pretend like you know what you're talking about when it comes to big data. I mean, you can you used to be able to you know walk to the conference and you could spew out the uh, uh, Hadoop uh, big yeah. data HDFS the buzzword and of then, the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we still have those, but now there's like 50 of them, and uh, they're they're a lot more varied. Um, so I think the real catalyst for this was what Christian mentioned was yet another resource manager Yarn, uh, and that's when it gave you the option to have a bunch of different processing um, for the, the same data. And that opened the door to the ones that I want to talk about today, which are primarily Storm, Spark, and Tez. So let's start with, uh, let's start with Storm. Th that's sort of a uh, completely different than the original Hadoop in the sense that it's our favorite buzzword, real time. Um, and the, the nature of it is um, you have instead of having the conventional MapReduce where you have this one um, unit of you know, partitioning and then calculating it and then recombining the results, you break it down into a DAG or a directed acyclic graph. Um, and basically what that means is the vertices of this graph are the processing points or in storm terms they're called bolts and the edges are called um, streams and that's where the data is moving so what was really important about this uh, advancement was that now you could take the data and and put it through multiple points in a, in a really um, unified way and and then store it in the database afterward so before you even um, had to put it in Hadoop file system to uh, to access it you could get the data right off of where it's coming from and start doing the processing right away. And that, that makes it a, a really valuable resources, resource for a lot of enterprise people because it allows them to make decisions so much quicker. Um, you don't have to do these batch jobs that can take a really long time. I mean, a, a good example of this is, um, and I'll, I'll get into this more later because Spark also applies to this, but the time reduction is so important in a lot of cases. Um, I had a graduate student that I was working under and the he was running like um, machine learning algorithms that would take days to run um, and the the fact of the matter is like he ran out of time to do all the processing that he wanted because he was constricted by the, the running time of these and to a certain extent this is really mitigated by programs like Storm and Spark which take advantage of not just real time processing but also in memory processing so that's, um, that's the next thing I want to talk about is moving on with uh, the the sort of one of the major evolutions of MapReduce is this notion that instead of having to write to disk in between steps, you keep everything in memory. And that's the difference between getting something out of your room and getting something out of 
the Milky Way galaxy. It's just orders of magnitude faster in a lot of cases. Um, and that's, that's part of the paradigm that Spark runs on. So you have this movement to in-memory data. And um, essentially, when you take it from the Hadoop file system, each point where you have the processing, it doesn't have to do a lot of, uh, it doesn't have to spend a lot of time on disk. And that's really where the, the benefits can show. These processes run hundreds of times faster than the, the conventional MapReduce programs. Um, so finally, I want to just talk and come back to Tez, and that's the, the, the real um, simple and unified way of coming up with these directed acyclic graphs. Um, and its, its main c contribution to this was coming up with that method of separating the MapReduce jobs into their own distinct um, ver edges and vertices and doing all of that together. So that's just three examples of, of things that are out there right now with Apache that are looking to revolutionize the way that you know what used to be Hadoop is now real time, is now in memory, and is now directed acyclic graphs instead of these you know single MapReduce programs that you have to string together to, to get anything useful out of. So um, I mean that's what I see is the big things that are coming up next. Do you have anything else that you wanted to add to that? Or do you have any other things that you think are going to be big? Well, I mean, big I, data? I think the, the reality of it, and I tell this to everyone, and I've been telling them even before all these different, uh, you know, applications and tools came out, is that your particular solution is always going to be different than the next guy for how you're going to pr process your particular data set. Because each data set is unique, and if we try and treat you know, certain types of data is like a very uniform, rigid format, then we don't always get the most value out of the data sets as we possibly can. So I always say, number one, your mileage is going to vary from like what the demo applications and what the demo setups and environments are on the internet. Um, and you got to find what that fit is and what that ecosystem is that's going to make the data fall through the, you know, fall through the cracks the way you want it to so that you're getting the actual insight. And that's really um, what's key about this, this whole notion. Um, you know, I think what's also interesting here is that there's two different communities that should really be paying attention to these types of newer platforms. I think academia is one of the biggest groups to benefit from this. Um, and that's really just like you're saying. I mean, there are plenty of graduate students and upper level research that's going on right now that requires intensive workloads, is very data driven in the research. And a lot of the hypotheses that uh, have to be accepted or rejected uh, using models, uh, mathematical models, require a lot of data points. So it really helps to be able to have the technology and the underlying framework that, you know, enables them to have those data points in an efficient way. I think the other big thing here to keep in mind is that, you know, there should be considerable benefits to the enterprise that have to be evaluated. And I, I think, what do I mean by that? Um, you know, how much money do you think your fortune at your average fortune 500 company spends on a SQL relational database, hiring SQL DBA admins, paying, you know, like Microsoft to have run to run SQL server 2014 enterprise CP one with, uh, you know, if, and if you want 10 of those to run all your relational databases, yeah, that'll be $3 million. Thank you very much. Um, what we're all talking about right here is open source. It's out there. You can develop it and customize it as you need and see fit. And one of the biggest things, and I stress, I've stressed this for years, is that a lot of times what makes big data work in the enterprise is never about the technologies so much as it is the people. I mean, you got to have smart people who are willing and open to taking these applications, figuring out creative way to implement them and, and push them out to what the enterprise needs. And, you know, obviously it helps having a lot of contributors working on these projects and saying, hey, you know, how do we keep getting towards, you know, making it attractive to the open source and to the academic communities, but also have all those enterprise security standards. And, you know, just the example is when uh, Hadoop 2.4 came out, which is the latest uh, general availability point release for um, that, that ecosystem, um, they 
particularly focused on making sure that things like Kerberos and LDAP authentication actually worked and, and so that the enter enterprise environment could support this. Um, one of the quick scary side stories is to that is that we found out on Home Gadget Geeks with John Nye last week that Kerberos has been completely torn apart at DEF CON and basically um, one of the speakers there showed how you could on an unauthenticated computer that's not even on the network as a trusted machine could generate basically um, bogus uh, requests to the Kerberos server and get for 20 minutes domain level administrative access and he called it the, the Willy Wonka golden ticket um, to the network and that you know 20 minutes is plenty of time to create your own little fake admin accounts and do this and that so that's got to be a huge pain uh, and we still we're waiting for Defcon to publish all the, um, the like the the their quote show notes and uh, the talks are always put publicly the full thing so we'll know more about whether that was a um, more of a Microsoft implementation issue or more of like a, hey, this is a core problem with how uh, Kerberos works and is implemented. Um, but the the whole idea is that we have to make sure that these technologies are comfortable for both the developer and the open community and um, the enterprise. And I really think we're starting to get there. I mean, big players like, you know, Google, Yahoo, Twitter, LinkedIn, Amazon. I mean, I can give you a, a bucket list of 500 companies right now that are using these technologies and arguably have been even before, you know, we really have the explosion of what Apache is doing out there. So I think those are all key things to be keeping in mind with these tools. Yeah, and I'd like to go back to what you were saying about this being like a human issue. Um, and on a lot of levels, that's really what it boils down to. We're, you, you and I and everybody else is generating more useful data than ever before. And the real problem is you have so much of it that it's hard to find the patterns in it. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think like you can, we, we can sit here and we can spew out our, our buzzwords and our, our different language like sounding things and it'll fly over some people's heads. But the when you get down to it, we're trying to model the human behavior and protect people. And that's, you know, cybersecurity and big data, that's what makes them a really good fit for each other. Um, that's another thing I kind of want to touch on. Like, I don't think that there's necessarily that much separation. I mean, there are different concepts, like there's cybersecurity. You can put cybersecurity over here and you can put uh, big data over here, but they're really becoming one and the same. Um, the more information you have to solve your problems, the better. And that's never been truer than with uh, cybersecurity as it is right now. Uh, I mean, a great example of this is machine learning. Like, necessarily, you have to have a certain size data set to, to make what you're doing useful. Um, and I think that we're moving towards, uh, away from, you know, <clears throat> what used to be, well, we've seen this one before, so we'll create a signature for it, and more going towards, we need to come up with ways of finding patterns in this and uh, find the anomalies. And, and that applies perfectly well to cybersecurity. That's really the basis of a lot of intrusion detection and prevention systems now. Um, and I think that the tools that I just talked about are really making moves to, to make that possible in a timely manner. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, uh, what are we noticing in, uh, you know, the, the outcoming graduates from things like University of Maryland and so forth is that the big, big demand right now is people, yeah, like it's great if you're a cybersecurity professional, it's great if you're a data professional, and even if you just have one of those, you're gonna get picked up somewhere. But if you have both of those and you really understand how they interact well between each other, you have a very unique skill set that a lot of people want uh, because there's, you know, <laughs> We have we have some interesting conversations about you know where is all the talent going in these areas in terms of like the people resources, and in DC we're convinced that there's a vacuum uh, because all the smart guys for like cloud for example and a lot of the people who are doing cloud right now are the types of people and the types of minds that you want doing these types of topics cybersecurity plus big data and they're all at AWS and Google I mean and those they you know especially like in the DC area the top notch talent that's where they're at and um, you know trying to pick up people fresh out of the university system that our um, you know companies can compete with and so forth that's a huge thing in DC and I mean 
all the environments are different and you know when you go to new york city in the finance sector or when you go out to silicon valley you're going to get different types of competition but that really seems to be the talk in dc and not only that um but the federal government is really starting to feel the uh, i would say the full bore um impetus to get on the bandwagon with you know the new tech and the, and the best talent they can get possible um, for these areas because it's so essential it's becoming incredibly essential even to the very foundational ways in which we run our government and whether it's you know keeping emails available on a on a backed up tape drive or um, you know keeping you know army and military networks secure there's a huge demand for these professionals um, so that's also again we want to be able to find ways in which, you know, especially these new people coming through the, the you know, the university system and, and through other channels, how do we get them on these topics and get them talking? Because there's a lot of talented people out there in these uh, topics right now, but there's just so much demand for it that it's just amazing how much uh, absorption there is still to be done to really grow out what I is really becoming a new uh, kind of business sector of the economy. So that's been uh, pretty interesting to watch, especially, you know, right when you're in the heart of DC, it's pretty evident what what avenues and, and pathways that's taking. So that's it's fun to watch. Yeah, and my computer is almost died because I forgot to plug it in, but that's okay now because I fixed it. Um, but going off of what you said is <clears throat> there's all of this um, talent out there. I mean, I, I I don't know if I agree about the talent vacuum in necessarily sense that there's no talent. I, I agree that it, it's probably being eaten up by um, gobbled up by companies like AWS and you know Google and things like that. But uh, what's really important to nurture this sort of things at an academic level and at a um, even an enterprise level is to create environments where you can have a community of people that are concerned about this and, and work together to do that. And I mean, that goes back to what we were talking about with open source and uh, nurturing communities there with the, the Apache Software Foundation, um, and also in the uh, academic settings like we have here. I would never have met you without things like the Advanced Cybersecurity Student for Experience for Students. Um, and I think a big part of combating the the issues that we're going to face with this huge amount of data and these huge new number of threats is getting people together and finding creative solutions. Yeah, and I, I think I, I think we're definitely starting to see the shift in how universities and corporations are treating these issues, um, especially at places like the University of Maryland, because now you know our, the computer science department is introducing data science specific courses into the 400 level curriculum, which is a huge deal. Um, you know, having an honors college dedicated to cybersecurity, these are new things for even the universities to kind of absorb and saying, oh, uh, you know, those are just buzzword topics to know. These are now part of our core curriculum because that's what's going to get people out in the industry doing these innovative things. So, yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, Jim, as a as a recruiter and uh, HR manager at Gallup, uh, I, oh, I don't, don't know how much that, <laughs> yeah, but uh, how much of uh, how much of this really resonates with a, you know, a company of, of Gallup size and, and especially especially because, you know, to the public. Gallup does so much for World Poll and Gallup Analytics and all that, and that's really valuable data to a lot of people. Where does you where, do you see any of this fitting into that picture? Uh, oh yeah. Is it, yeah, yeah, all of it, right? I mean, we, we've got a lot of data, although, you know, we have less data than I think people think, but more than most, right? So sure, it's uh, you know when, when you ask questions in, in a one to five scale, that doesn't take up very much space in a database, you know, and so uh, you can do that pretty efficiently, but. Um, especially, we're collecting more and more of that all the time. In fact, we're we're you know we're going global. We're going more frequently global uh, with our polling and, and the way we're doing. the The question, Christian, really is for us at the bottom of the day is getting that data out fast, right? That's really right. when you come down to it. The, the the time of crunching that stuff forever is just over. Real and, time, um, yeah, real time. Yeah, you got to get it. You got to get it in and get it out. You want you have researchers who are crunched for time and they're like. I want to put this stuff in. I want to grind it. I want to back. And, um, you know, we have gone to a lot of the systems, uh, Ashton, that you're talking about. We do a lot of in-memory stuff. We've gone complete SSD in a lot of our database environments. We still use 
we're an Oracle customer. We've still got Oracle databases that we do. The the day of the relational database is not completely over yet. They're, they're, they're no, still out not. there. And, <laughs> certainly and, not. Yeah. And not for many more years. And no. that's not a bad thing either. I, I mean, it's it, that's just how it is. There's just yeah, some yeah. data that will always be tabular. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's just some for a while. There will just be it'll just make it still makes sense to put that in a relational form. Not all, you know, not all data is going to go that way. I think of, you know, ERP systems work fairly well in a relational uh, environment. And so that's just kind of the way it goes. But, yeah, uh, Christian, we're spending we're trying to spend as much as we can, as much time as we can and resources that we can afford asking these questions that you guys are talking about. That's not my area, although it is now a little bit because I work with you. Uh, a lot, and we're making that your area in some ways. Not, not I think as much as you'd like, but we'll get there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I guess the the one big thing here is I want to draw some attention to CyberFrontierLabs.com, which is now going to be uh, the official laboratory of this podcast. And what we're trying to do out there is provide you access to the open source community to these open source projects and show you you know how in a day and a couple hours of your time you can get started with some of these things and work it into your learning um, ashton just wrote a really great post on how you can set up spark in a hordenworks sandbox hordenworks is one of the uh, uh, main big data vendors out there that's uh, they make their own uh, package source code off of um, off of the uh, Apache uh, base base systems, and uh, he did a really nice write up on uh, how you can calculate pi using uh, Apache Spark and that Horton Workspace platform. So that's kind of the equivalent of a word count, but uh, you know it, it shows you a really clean and nice way to get started on a nice little experiment and get that environment set up. And then from there, you know it's it's entirely up to you what you want to do next for uh, processing data. So go ahead and check out that again. That's cyberfrontierlabs.com. No S. Uh, yeah, no, no S in Frontiers, but S in Labs. Um, and uh, I've been tweeting about it a bit. So if you follow me at the WizBM, I post a lot of stuff related to cybersecurity, big data, and cloud. That's kind of my area. Uh, so if you want to give me a follow out there, uh, you'll definitely uh, see this content showing up in your stream. Ashton, anything else you want to throw in as we wrap it up? No, I mean, if anyone has questions on Storm or Spark, especially, I uh, am currently working with Storm for Singer Yafarian Technologies, um, and I've learned a lot about Spark just on my own um, for Cyber Frontier Labs. So uh, <clears throat> if you have questions, then um, I guess the best way would be through email. I'm, I'm not a big Twitter user yet, but I'm trying to get into that as well, so I'll let you know when that becomes a thing. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can also put them in the chat. Do you want to, um, Ashton, you want to throw your email out there or do you want to? Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's ashton.webster at gmail dot between Ashton and Webster. Oh, we had failed a already. With, uh... I, I tried so hard. I worked so hard on this. <laughs> Ashton at cyberfrontierlabs.com. Oh, I can't name the right one. You're right. Just, just Ashton try. at cyberfrontierlabs.com. All right. There, there we go. Well, that's right, Christian. Sometimes it just takes us a while to I know. Those custom on domain names. Are there's just... a lot of brand new stuff. <laughs> uh, there's just a ton of brand new stuff going on. Uh, you know, Christian and I have been thinking about this concept for a long time. Uh, just he and I, we've had some guests on here as well. And uh, and we are really going to make a run this fall to kind of get more consistent with it. And each and every week, I think uh, having Ashton on uh, will help uh, as well as he comes back. Hopefully he'll come back. Will you come back? Oh, yeah. oh yes, definitely. This? Okay, yeah. good. As long as you'll have me. <laughs> <laughs> good. And then uh, it, um, Christian mentioned John Nye, and we had uh, John Nye's a local Omaha guy, so it'll be the two Omaha guys against the two D.C. guys uh, there. And uh, John will come back from time to time. He'll help us. He's got a young family, so we can't have him all the time, but we'll bring him on yeah, as needed, especially when we're getting into the nitty-gritty, the hacking stuff that he's so good at. And uh, if you missed it, Cyber Frontiers 180 actually – you haven't missed it yet. We haven't put it out yet. So home, gadget, home Gadget home Geeks. Home Gadget one, Geeks. Yeah. yeah, Home Gadget Geeks 180 is set to release this weekend, so you just haven't seen it yet. Uh, but it is on its way. If you're listening to the recorded version of this a little bit later, it will be out uh, here. Just look for Home Gadget Geeks 180. A couple reminders. Are we okay to bring this in for landing, Christian? You ready for me? Yeah, to... yeah, absolutely. Okay, we'll do that. So a couple reminders. One, uh, I'll remind you, we do have an average guy last pass trial for the, uh, for the Enterprise. And a lot of you have, uh, have taken a look at it already, but if you think uh, you might use LastPass in the enterprise, they were kind enough to 
Give us a little affiliate link for that as well. Just go to theaverageguy.tv slash last pass trial. All one word at the end there. Last pass trial will get you there. Want to say thank you for using the Amazon affiliate link like we do every week. It's we've had a great month, and of course that we roll those dollars back into upgrades and giveaways. We just buy stuff. If you want to try something out for that, we'll buy it for you. You can try it, and then uh, you get to keep it. You just got to write something up for theaverageguy.tv. And we actually had a. I just bought something for a guy and it didn't really work very well and he's kind of like oh, it was John, John's kind of afraid to write about it because he doesn't want to do that but that's good stuff to know so we're going to talk about that at the home server show meetup speaking of that a lot of you in our home server show community but if you're anywhere near Indianapolis Indiana September 20th we are doing a tech meetup there Indianapolis the details for that will be in the show notes with a link as well but uh, about 50 of us get together we, this will be the fifth annual one you probably don't want to miss it if you're anywhere close to for you to a little too far to get you all the way out to Indianapolis but uh, we'll, we'll get together 20 bucks get you in and uh, we're gonna have a great time out there September 20th link will be in the show notes and uh, last but lot, not least I've worked super hard on a whole bunch of ways to subscribe to everything now. And so including this, Cyber Frontiers, if you want to get this via RSS video now and iTunes video, both a small and large version of that are available for you out there. All the links out at theaverageguide.tv slash subscribe. That's hard to say. Too many too many S's in that. Theaverageguide.tv slash subscribe. And uh, that uh, there's a whole bunch of new options for all the podcasts. Uh, and Home Gadget Geek, Cyber Frontiers, and the new Home Tech Tips. If you haven't checked that out, we got a bunch of short little tips for you. No way we could get this information in short little tips, you guys. Just too detailed <laughs> stuff. But short tips for you out at Home Tech Tips. All that is available for you. All right, we're going to shoot for two weeks from now. I think this. I like this Monday format. Did that work pretty well for you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're going to shoot for two weeks from now, uh, which is uh, August. Uh, no, that's actually September 1st. And uh, we are going to try this again and uh, get a regular basis going for Cyber Frontier. So if you're not doing anything on Monday nights, a good opportunity for you to join us live out here at theaverageguy.tv slash live. We'll shoot for 8 p.m. as well. That's a good time for me, so that works. want to thank you, Christian, you, Ashton, for coming out and, uh, and doing the program tonight. And we'll stay around for a little bit of post-show. But until next time, thanks, guys. Everybody have a good night. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Thank you.